And we're going to move into our agenda. And um, Mr. Cassidy, are you going to kind of lead us through these, or should we just go straight to Sean? Uh, Mr. Dorsey uh, will be the uh, MC this evening. All right, we do have a slightly revised agenda. We've added an item first on the mosquito abatement and Zika virus update. Um, apparently, our resource became available last minute, and we thought we'd take advantage of the opportunity. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Patrick Irwin. He is with the Northwest Mosquito Abatement District, and he is with us this evening to give a short presentation about uh, the district's uh, abatement measures, as well as an update on the nature of the threat uh, from the Zika virus. Mr. Irwin. Welcome. Thank you. Will my slides show up? Yeah, they should. There. Okay. Hi there. Again, I'd like to introduce my name. My name is Patrick Irwin. I'm from the Northwest Mosquito Abatement District, of which you are part of. And I'd just like to talk to you a little bit about mosquitoes, what we do at Northwest Mosquito Abatement, West Nile virus, which is a very real concern here. And then I'd like to talk a little bit about what's going on with Zika and what the district is doing in response to that potential threat. So, our Northwest Mosquito Abatement was uh, founded in 1956, and we cover 242 square miles. You can see we go all the way to, in the west to Hanover and Barrington, all the way to the east parts of Northfield, Northfield and Maine. We're so big that we actually have our main shop, which is on uh, Hints Road, 147 West Hints, and we have two auxiliary shops that we run May through October. One is down in Elk Grove, and the other one is out in uh, Barrington off Bartlett Road. A little bit of the numbers here. We have 12 full-time employees, of which I am one. We hire about anywhere between 50 and 60 college-age students to help us out during the summer because the main focus of what we do is at trying to attack mosquito lar mosquitoes at the aquatic stage and the larval stage. But it is a huge job. We have over 10 thousand surface waters that are cataloged and mapped and we have at least 65,000 catch basins throughout our entire district that we try to get to monitor and treat to prevent mosquitoes from emerging from there. We're controlled by a board of trustees that is appointed by the Cook County Commissioner. There's five of them. They're all volunteers and they basically oversee our entire operations, take care of you know personnel issues, those sort of things. We have 750,000 people in our district, and our budget is about 3 million. I think it's a little bit higher, maybe about 3.3 million, and that's funded through all your property taxes. So if you look at your property tax bill and you start going down under special ta taxing districts, you'll find us. And we've calculated out that it comes out to about $3 per $100,000 worth of property tax. So the average house, if it's $250,000, about $7 a year comes to us. So what is our mission? At Northwest Mosquito Abatement, our mission is to try to manage the population of mosquitoes that stop people from being able to enjoy the outdoors. We want people to be able to be outdoors, walk through the forest preserves, go on picnics, those sort of things. We also are really concerned about mosquitoes that carry diseases that can be transmitted to people. We've really sort of, since the introduction of West Nile virus, we've really moved towards that because I'll be talking a little a little bit about West Nile virus and what it happens when it gets into the uh, human population. We really strive to use the most environmentally friendly um, products and uh, techniques to abate mosquitoes. We don't want to be exposing people to really toxic or nasty chemicals. So that is one of the reasons why we have found that if we attack them at the larval stage, we can use uh, things that do not impact people or animals' health as much as if we do have to go out night spraying, even though when we do go night spraying, we are using a pesticide that is incredibly safe for people, the environment, and their pets. A little bit mosquito facts. I'm always surprised when, I, when I'm talking to a group of people like this, people think a mosquito is a mosquito is a mosquito. We have over 30 different mosquitoes that are found here just in our district, and there are two main types of mosquitoes. There are the mosquitoes that attack you when you're outside, when you're out there trying to grill your steaks or have a party or something like that. And those are ones that can come out in just massive numbers. I mean, sure, I'm sure everyone here has tales of trying to go out and enjoy an evening to just be swarmed by mosquitoes and sent flying back into your house. There's another kind. It's called a disease vector mosquitoes. 
These are the ones that carry West Nile virus. And I'm going to talk a little bit about sort of the dichotomy between these two at a later date. Only the females will take blood meals. And as you can see from here, I don't have a clicker, but you can see the life cycle of mosquitoes. And really, that normally happens. It normally takes about 10 days from a mosquito taking a blood meal to laying her eggs for them to develop all the way through and become adults. They can go faster depending on the weather. If it's really warm, it can get, they can get through in as, as few as five days. If it's cooler, it may take anywhere from 10 days to two weeks. So now I'm going to switch over to West Nile virus, which is a concern in this area. Chicago, northwest suburbs, tends to be a hot spot in the Midwest for, north, uh, for uh, West Nile virus. It's normally maintained between birds and mosquitoes. The mosquitoes that, that carry West Nile virus feed primarily on birds. There is sometimes what's known as spillover, where they will take a blood meal, an opportunistic blood meal from humans or horses, and that's how people can become infected with West Nile virus. I'm going to talk a little bit more about numbers of, of um, West Nile virus. It first appeared in Cook County in uh, 2001, and the first human cases were seen in 2002. So we're going into our 14th year of it here. These numbers need to be slightly updated from, these are from last year. Cook County has had over 1,200 cases with 65 deaths. I think that's probably, you can raise that number up to about 1,300 by now, and I think it's 74 deaths have occurred in the county. Um, in all of Illinois, over 2,000 cases of West Nile virus in that 14 years and 124 deaths. U.S., we're starting, we have 40,000 cases that have been reported and almost 16, over 1,600 deaths. And most of the human cases appear between late July and October. Usually after the first freeze, mosquitoes disappear. I'm going to talk a little bit about the signs, symptoms, and treatment for West Nile virus. Now, West Nile virus is one of those unusual arboviruses where 80% of people that get West Nile virus have absolutely no, no symptoms. I would be very shocked to find out if, the, if any people in this room, if at least one or several people have had West Nile virus and not had any symptoms. About 20% of people that get it will develop what's known as West Nile fever. This is where you don't feel good for about three days. You may have a fever, a headache, you might ache, but you're going to recover. A small percentage of people that get West Nile virus, it will actually get cause a central nervous system disease where it crosses the blood-brain barrier, gets into your brain, and causes encephalitis. This is a life-threatening disease, and it can be incredibly debilitating. About 10% of people that get uh, the central nervous system involvement will die, but usually of the people that do get central nervous system involvement, it can be a very long road to recovery. Um, it can be almost as, as bad as somebody having a, a, a mid-level stroke. You may have to learn how to talk again, walk again. Many of these people end up in long-term uh, in long-term like nursing homes before they can go back and return to daily life. So the people that are at most the greatest risk for West Nile virus are people over the age of 65 and people that have uh, have. Uh, suppressed immune system due to either having cancer, HIV, other advanced diseases. Um, so I will continue on with this. Oh, unfortunately, one of my slides got moved up. So what is the district's response to West Nile virus? And you can also say this sort of about what is our response to Zika virus. We do a lot of larval surveillance. So normally people, when they say, I never see these trucks out doing anything, in the in, in, uh, except for when they're going out spraying. That's because they're usually out in some of the less known, less, less populated areas looking for mosquito larvae. So we normally have 30 trucks out every day that are doing surveillance in aquatic sites looking to see if we can find larvae. If we find larvae in these water bodies, we treat them. That's probably about 90% of the work that we do in terms of trying to control the population is at the <clears throat> larval stage. What I do as the entomologist is I run 39 traps spread out throughout the entire district. I monitor those seven days a week, and that way I can look and see what are the populations of nuisance mosquitoes. Are they going up in certain areas? Are they going up district-wide? Or are we starting to see more of the disease vector mosquitoes in our area? 
I can also take those disease vectors and do an in-house bioassay where I can look to see how many of these mosquitoes have West Nile virus so that I can start <coughs> seeing where the trends are going with that. We do do some adult treatment and sort of our standard for that is if we see 35 new or more nuisance mosquitoes in a tra in, uh, in <coughs> per trap for more than three straight days or I get West Nile virus on two consecutive days from the same trap. So what can you do to help reduce mosquitoes in your backyard? Don't let water stand in your backyard. If you have things that are holding water for more than five days, it's best if you dump them out, like bird baths, dump them out, refill them. Don't have standing buckets or five gallon pails that you use for do it yourself repairs. Don't have those standing by your garage that can fill up with water. If you have kids, if they have kiddie pools, that can be an incredible place for mosquitoes to breed because kids will use it once or twice and then you leave it out rain fills it up, we can get literally thousands of mosquitoes out of a kiddie pool like that. Make sure your gutters are draining. Make sure you don't have, if you have canoes or boats, make sure that they're turned upside down or they have a tarp over them so that they can't fill with water. Backyards can be a major place for producing mosquitoes. And you want to only, and not only that, but you also want to make sure that your neighbors are doing this too. So what can you do about mosquito bites? How can you avoid them? One of the first things to do is wear long sleeves and pants when outdoors. I know it's not very comfortable, but that is really the best way to, to handle this. Try to avoid being out at dusk and dawn and wear insect repellent when mosquitoes are present. And there are three products that you can use that are long-term mosquito repellents. Most people know about DEET, and that's fine, but a lot of people don't like the smell of DEET or the feel of it. You can also use a new product called Picaridin or oil of lemon eucalyptus. You may see a lot of products when you go to other shops that say rosemary oil or catnip oil or anything like that. I have done research on this. Almost any product that you put on your skin will reduce the number of mosquitoes that are biting you for about 30 minutes. It basically serves as a camouflage. After 30 minutes, it's gone. So if you're gonna be spending time out in the, your backyard for a couple of hours, you wanna use one of these type of products. And I was kind of telling you about this dichotomy about mosquitoes. So the weird thing is, is that because there are two, two types, nuisance mosquitoes and these vector mosquitoes, when we see the most West Nile virus get into the human population is when during a drought and warm temperatures when we don't have the nuisance mosquitoes out. So if you're thinking in, let's say this year, in July, August, September, you're outside and you're like, there are no mosquitoes out. How wonderful, how great. That is the biggest time, the biggest time when we will have disease vector mosquitoes out and feeding. So when you don't think they're out there and biting, you may only take one or two bites during an entire evening being outside. The chance is that those may be disease vector mosquitoes and they may have West Nile virus. So now I'm gonna turn my attention to Zika virus that is all that is in the media. There are two species of mosquitoes that we know of for sure that can transmit Zika virus and they are not found in the Chicago area. They are found in the southern part of Illinois and there is a possibility that they could be transported up to us in like a semi truck. And we are actually actively monitoring. I have special traps that are out through, throughout the district that are looking for these two species. They've been out since May 1st. I haven't found any of them. I don't expect to find any of these mosquitoes. They really do not like the kind of weather that we have here. They want warmer. They certainly cannot overwinter here. So Zika virus, just like West Nile virus, 80% of people that get Zika will have absolutely no symptoms. And of the 20% that will have symptoms, again, they may not feel very good. A small portion of them may go on to develop CNS involvement. They may get what's known as Guillain-Barre syndrome, maybe some flaccid paralysis. Um, but again, West Nile virus is a problem here. Zika isn't a problem here, and I don't expect it to be. So here you can sort of see a map of where you can see in the United States where we do have the vectors. 
80s Egypti is the one in sort of in purple, if you can see it down there. That's Florida, Georgia, uh, Mississippi, Alabama, and part of Texas. That is the major vector. 80s Albopictus, which has a much uh, wider range in farther north, is considered to be a moderate vector of 80s Albopictus. And most of the research that has been out there, there have been some some of my colleagues at uh, other universities or NIH or in Brazil have been doing studies to see if some of the species that we do have here are effective vectors for West Nile virus. And so far, they have not really found that they are very good vectors, especially in the laboratory. Normally, you can take a mosquito species and test it in the lab. They tend to be slightly better in the lab than in the real world. But so far, the species that we have here, there's no indication that the species found here are very good vectors. I just wanted to talk a little bit also about Zika virus. I'd like to say that our district does have a plan in case we do start getting what is known as locally acquired Zika virus here for how we can go after the mosquitoes in this area. That's available if people want to call up the district and uh, we can provide that to them. But basically what it involves is finding out where a Zika virus case existed, going there using as many resources as we can to do surveillance and see where the mosquitoes may be breeding, emptying that out, emptying out all the water, maybe involving some nighttime spraying in a specific area. And then uh, if it moves out from that, continuing to expand the ring. Again, I don't think in my, in my opinion, that isn't going to be a problem. But one of the problems with Zika virus is, unlike West Nile virus, people can serve as a host for Zika virus. So let's say somebody comes back from Venezuela and they have Zika. If we had the species of mosquitoes there, they could take, a mosquito could take a blood meal from that person infected with Zika, become infected with Zika, and then pass it on to somebody else. That is not the case with the mosquitoes that spread West Nile virus. We are what is known as a dead end host. We do not produce enough virus in our system to infect another mosquito that can then go on and transmit it to somebody else. This slide here really talks about uh, the possible transmission uh, from the mother to baby during pregnancy. Most of the research says now that if a woman is in the first trimester and gets Zika virus, that is usually where the problem really occurs. Later on in pregnancy, the risk of transmitting to your baby, it falls off quite significantly. And with that, I am more than willing to answer any questions that the committee may have. Questions, anyone? Richard? There was some concern that if someone uh, contracted the Zika virus, that they could transmit it through uh, sexual contact <clears throat> versus uh, um, being bit by a, a yes, that is, that is true, and they are finding that in some cases that the virus remains active in a person for up to two weeks. They're saying one week for sure, but per chance up to two weeks, depending on the individual. And that yes, there have been cases in the United States where it has been where somebody has had uh, sexual contact with somebody that had Zika virus and become infected with it. So that that is one area that we're that is, can be a problem. Okay, and have you found any kind of a preventative cure? I, and I, there, I use it, the cure loosely um, to, to prevent or to, to at least slow down the virus. So they're really, other than doing, being very vigilant and looking for the mosquito, uh, the mosquito that can spread Zika virus, n no, there really isn't. In terms of if somebody gets Zika, all that they can do is offer what is known as supportive care make sure, you know, get them into the hospital, make sure that they're giving them plenty of fluids, monitoring their breathing, that sort of thing. In terms of a cure, I know there are places that are now trying to come up with a vaccine, but some arboviruses are notoriously difficult to produce a vaccine. Zika is very closely related to uh, a disease that has been pretty much knocking on our doorstep for 40 years, dengue fever, which infects a great deal of people across the developing world. And they've been trying for 40 years to develop uh, uh, a vaccine to dengue, and it's been very resistant to that. So. Thank you. Steve, I saw your hand. Thanks for coming here. I think a lot of people have questions about this, and it's a lot better to inform people of issues so that they're a little bit more educated. Um, I know that, like the Red Cross that does a lot of blood transfusions and some other groups, 
they have like a four week waiting period. If yes. you've been traveling, they question you at the beginning of yes. a blood transfusion. I was wondering maybe you could explain to the people here and the people that are watching uh, that the tr about the uh, possibility of transmission of Zika through uh, a blood transfusion. Yes, I think there's a very real possibility through uh, blood transfusion, but I'm, I'm sure that the Red Cross has once again used, uh, because you can also transmit a lot of other arboviruses, West Nile virus can be transmitted through uh, looking for, through blood products. And so since West Nile virus and Zika are very closely related, I'm sure that they're basically looking at the same things and testing for both of these so that they're making sure that blood products are as safe as possible for the public. Thank you. Colleen? Um, thank you for coming. I found it very informative and I, I hope that um, people will continue to watch this and stream it because I think it provides a lot of great information for our residents. Um, I just had a couple of questions on prevention. You talked sure. about spraying um, and you're monitoring these traps. And so is there a regular schedule of spraying or is it just as There as isn't. Needed? Basically we look and because we're monitoring these traps every day, um, I am looking at the trends to see where they're going and we have sort of thresholds for when we think we might need to go out and spray to really kind of knock the population back down. We're nowhere near that right now. And it's very rare that we do actually hit that those thresholds. In the past couple of years, we've actually gone out spraying on average five to maybe seven times <clears throat> per, uh, per season, usually once in the far west region of uh, in Barrington, where it's a lot more uh, uh, rural area, a lot more forest preserves. That's where we tend to see a lot of the nuisance mosquitoes. It tends to be on the east end of our district where we start seeing West Nile virus uh, occurring in the mosquitoes. And once we start seeing traps that have, you know, one, two, three, four positives, then we know this is an area that we may need to go out to and do a delta sighting. We normally do try to raise the amount of larva sighting that we do. We will have, have a tendency to have more crews go out into areas with where we're starting to see uh, West Nile virus in the mosquitoes <laughs> because it's really much easier, much uh, more environmentally friendly and cost effective for us to attack mosquitoes at the aquatic stage. Then I had a question about plants. I know some are advertised as, you know, repelling mosquitoes. Are there some that are better than others? Do they not really work anyway? They, they really don't work. A lot of my, uh, a lot of sort of the fun projects I got to do in grad school was sort of doing myth busters with undergrads where we would test all sorts of these things that you'll find on the internet. Um, you know, there's some, some people say if you take uh, either garlic pills or B1 pills, that that will help prevent mosquitoes from biting you. That's not true. Um, you know, people will say, oh, if you have geraniums or you have citronella plants on there, that will reduce mosquitoes. No, I mean, they're pretty plants. There's no reason not to have them, but they're certainly not gonna do anything in terms, of, in terms of biting pressure in your backyard. So you really want to look at, if you're really interested in this, you really wanna to go to the CDC or EPA and really look for their recommendations because those are scientists. Those are people that have tested this stuff and made sure that it's effective. Um, otherwise, there I know there are a lot of mosquito traps that are out there that'll say they'll reduce the mosquitoes in your backyard. I've done research on them. They don't really work. They actually increase the rate of uh, mosquitoes in your backyard. Um, in terms of wearing some of these, I, I've seen some of them where they're these like little plastic bands that you can put around your wrist and they'll say that'll protect your children. I mean, they're, they're playing on your, on your fears and you're wanting to keep your children safe. They don't work. Um, so there's a lot of shoddy science and products out there that are, you know, playing on your fears of West Nile virus Zika. Really do your homework whenever you're gonna invest in any of these things. And the products that I told you about, DEET, picaridin, and oil of lemon eucalyptus, those have been scientifically tested over and over and over again. And those are the best products to use. I just have one thing for Sean. If you could just um, talk about our rain barrel program and the importance of mm -hmm. installing them properly and the uh, maybe the safety feature that's on there with the netting. Certainly all of the rain barrels uh, that, that we offer as part of our program with the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District, uh, homeowners uh, throughout the village can receive up to four uh, at no cost, so they'll be delivered to your home. Uh, the way that these rain barrels are designed is they're to intercept a downspout from your home 
uh, it spills into the uh, the rain barrel uh, through a covered screen, and it's a, a screen that's been specifically designed to keep out mosquitoes and mosquito larvae. Uh, Patrick is familiar with them, uh, especially the type that's offered by the MWRD and the type that are part of our program. So we don't, we think that the design of the rain barrel uh, provides good protection against mosquitoes. <clears throat> Thank you. Yeah, I could talk just uh, briefly about that. I have them in my backyard. I have a six-year-old son. Uh, yeah, they have screens on them. As long as you make sure those screens are on, never any problem. What you're really looking for in people's backyards are the, you know, 30-gallon trash can with no lid on it. Mm -hmm. Or as I said, these five-gallon buckets or anything else that can hold water. The rain barrels are an absolutely great idea, mm -hmm. environmentally friendly, and we've never had a problem with them in terms of producing mosquitoes. Thank you very much. Would you please tell uh, Trustee Matuzic to lay off the garlic uh, pills? <laughs> oh, okay, yeah. yeah, yeah. And you can eat bananas. I did research on if bananas would, would make so you go more, with bananas. Would, would make you people more attractive you. to mosquitoes, oh. and that's also a fallacy. Mm -hmm. So uh, what I wanted to ask you is um, West Nile virus shows up here in 2001. Is, that's what I saw? It, it, yeah, it, show, it showed up in the bird population. That's where we first start seeing it because... As you remember, one of my slides says, it, you know, it basically travels between mosquitoes and birds. They primarily feed on birds until later on in the season when the birds are starting getting ready to migrate and disperse. And that's when there may not be enough birds for them to feed on. They tend to switch to other mammalian hosts, which may include humans. I see. I, re I think I remember that there was a huge die-off, wasn't there, in the bird population? About 80% of the crows in the Blue Jays in Cook County died off within, I think, the first four years. I mean, I've, I have not been here that long, but I've heard tell that you could drive down in you know, Arlington Heights, Mount Prospect, and you would find a dead crow every two yards. And those numbers are starting to rebound. When I first started here, I've been working here for four years. I never, I didn't see a crow here. And I was like, okay, I've, I'd heard tell that that had happened. You are now starting to see a slow increase in those and blue jays. They are coming back because basically what it did, West Nile virus wiped out all the susceptible populations and those that are genetically uh, uh, able to fight off the virus are the ones that have survived. They're passing it on to their offspring. So their numbers are rebounding. And then relative to Zika, you know, we never, I never heard of it until this year, right? right. And then all right. of a sudden, there's this big concern. Was it was it somewhere? Just never got up. It was so Zika virus, like many of these arboviruses, came out of Africa, and it was first discovered, I believe, in like 1947, and it basically stayed there. Uh, like so many of these diseases that that are of tropical origins, it wasn't really until we started getting this globalization, where people would start going to. Africa for travel, uh, for vacations, or where we would start getting products from Africa. It then jumped from Africa, then in the mid-2000s, it jumped into the uh, Southeast Asia, and then into the Pacific Islands. There was a huge outbreak in 2007 on the island of Yap. I, can't, I think there were 35,000 cases of it. And then 2014, it popped up in Brazil. And they think probably because there were so many people that were coming from all over the world to see the World Cup in Brazil. And they have the species and the disease that came there. As I said, people can serve as a host and infect mosquitoes. Um, and you started seeing this huge number of outbreaks. It's been going on there since 2014. The numbers have become really big. It really didn't become a huge issue until they started to find out that there was this microcephaly that there were babies being born with abnormally small brains and brain damage to it. 2014, you started seeing also the spread of it into the Caribbean, Mexico, the rest of South America. And then, as I said, it's knocking on our door, but we've had a lot of these diseases spread by these same species. Chikungunya has been knocking on the door of the U.S., spread by Aegypti and Albopictus. It's been here for two years. There have been no local transmission cases of chikungunya. Dengue has been knocking on our door for 40 years. We only have sporadic outbreaks, usually in places that are right next to the border of Mexico or far southern uh, Florida. It's for several reasons. One of the things is that is because we are tend to be a wealthier country. We have screens on our windows, so we don't have mosquitoes in our house. We tend to watch TV. <laughs> 
And people, when mosquitoes get bad, tend to use repellent. And we have mosquito abatement. So we're, you know, the message has gotten out there and people are really taking a lot of precautions about this. And as I said, places where they're really worried about Zika getting a foothold in Florida, they have excellent mosquito abatement. So that's really sort of our first line. So it doesn't get a hold in Florida, Texas, some of these other places. And then <laughs> vigilant monitoring to see if we start seeing some of these species move. Since they are only about 200 miles away, we certainly could have somebody that picks up a uh, a bunch of used tires, let's say, in central Illinois, drives them up here and drops them off to be retreaded that have the eggs in them, they get wet. We have never found albopictus or aegypti in our district or in Cook County. Great, thank you for that. A good presentation and good questions. I have a question myself. Sure. So I have a koi pond in my backyard, and it's got a waterfall, and it's constantly recirculating through a biofilter, a bunch of rocks and things like yep. that. So I always assume that between the fish and the filter and the circulation, the pond itself is not an that issue. That is exact. You are exactly correct. But if it has fish and I moving get, water. I get a lot of gardening catalogs and everything. Yeah. Anybody who's got a fish pond probably is into gardening. Yeah. Um, and I see products advertised. They look like they're big disintegrating tablets that yep. you can put in water. If you have perpetually standing water because mm -hmm. it's just a low-lying boggy area or right. whatever, does that particular product help to keep the mosquitoes down? Or it is does. It, it kills the mosquitoes and it kills them within 24 hours. Uh -huh. It's actually uh, stuff that we use ourselves when we find mm -hmm. large populations of this. It's a bacterial toxin that's very environmentally friendly. I mean, I, basically I could stand up here with that project and eat it it wouldn't cause any problems other than tasting terrible. Um, you know, it doesn't affect fish. It doesn't really affect other, inver uh, other aquatic invertebrates. Your kids could play in the water uh, mm -hmm. if you were using this. As I said, it's very targeted towards mosquitoes and it works very well. Okay. Problem is, is that you have to keep reapplying it okay. because as we get rain, it dilutes it out. So it will last anywhere from, I think, uh, 14 days to 30 days maximum. Mm -hmm. So you may have to keep reapplying that but if you have bird baths or if you have if you have ornamental ponds any water body in our area that has what we call sort of been naturalized meaning it has fish frogs other in, uh, insects we don't really find mosquitoes there um, the fish really love to eat them it's these places that we call ephemeral water bodies areas that flood dry out flood dry out they can't sustain any of these natural predators in them because they don't have hold water long enough that's where we really see our problem with mosquitoes. Cool. Okay. Any questions from the audience on mosquitoes? Okay. Thank you so much. That was a great update. Oh, Appreciate no problem. it. And thank you very much thank for you. the invitation. I really enjoy speaking to this. And if any of you have other organizations that you're part of where you'd like me to come speak to, I am always available, even at the last minute. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.